Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us into the unknown? I'm Cynthia. And I'm Stephanie. And you have found the Dark Oak. Today we discuss what is often referred to as the Dream House murder, and it's the really sad murder of real estate agent Lindsay Buziak. Mm, this doesn't sound like a Barbie Dream House moment here. It is definitely not a happy Barbie Dream House moment for sure. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Dark Oak, the mystery podcast with purpose. Each month through our charity called the Branch of Hope Foundation, we give a portion of earnings from our Patreon and sponsors to a nonprofit organization related to the first episode of the month. To find out how you can be part of the movement, head over to thedarkoak.com or stay with us until the end of the episode and we'll give you all the deets. Thanks, Stephanie. Now, before we get into today's episode, I wanted to give you a little update. So a few weeks back, I presented the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. For us, it felt like current history, Mm -hmm. but I think for a few people, they had known her name, but didn't really know her story. So it's been really encouraging to, to know that her, again, her story is back out there and we've drawn some more attention to it. So again, fingers crossed that we get some answers on that case. Oh, I would love nothing more. And you're right. I've gotten a lot of feedback on that case too. And some of the feedback I got is really exciting. In that episode, towards the end, I mentioned that there were some similarities between Jennifer's case and the disappearance of a woman named Tara Grinstead. Oh, yeah. Now, in that episode, I mentioned that I had not done any research on Tara's case. And so, so many people reached out and let us know Tara's case has actually been solved, which is so exciting. But here's the coolest part. The Up and Vanished podcast covered it. It was their first season of the Up and Vanished podcast where they covered this case of Tara Grinstead. And that brought so much new, fresh attention to the case. And they believe that is part of what helped this case get solved. Get out! Isn't that crazy? Doing good work. I love that Up and Vanished podcast. Me too. So it's just a good reminder about the real why we do this. Yeah. We don't just talk about these people. We don't just tell these really sad stories, you know, just for entertainment. Like we are really, truly hoping to shed some light because if the right person hears something and says something, we can help bring closure to families. So I just wanted to give everybody that little update on the Tara Grinstead case. Well, now, okay. As it relates to Jennifer Kessie's case, though, you said it was possibly the same killer. Are they still thinking that's a possibility? Well, or I guess abductor, because we don't know where Jennifer is. I I really don't think so. Okay. The person who murdered Tara, I guess, potentially could have been responsible. There were actually two men who were involved. They, I guess, technically could have been responsible for Jennifer's disappearance, but I don't think so. It seemed to be more of an isolated case, although they did have a long uh, rap sheet of violence and, and things of that nature. But no, I personally don't think it was connected but because both women went missing in similar circumstances that's why there was you know a little bit of a question as to could they have potentially been both murdered by a serial killer again this was before tara's case was actually solved right so it was a good lead but as it turns out the two may not be related may not be related i don't still they are such a relief for tara's family that they now have some answers and i think we're just gonna hope and pray that the Kessie family gets the same. I would absolutely love to see Jennifer's family get that closure. Same girl, same. Well, Stephanie, as you know, before I was a podcast host, I was an avid podcast listener. I've never known you to not be a podcast host, (laughs) even if only in your own mind. That's true. (laughs) Well, was I a podcast host in third grade? (laughs) I don't even know that we had podcasts back then. You were a news anchor. That's what you were then. Oh, that is true. That is true. (laughs) Which is, I mean, we're just a modern version of that now, right? We absolutely Except we don't have any agenda. No political agenda except for solving cases. Correct. (laughs) So better. Better. Way better. (laughs) Way better. New and improved. 
Well, because I was such a podcast listener, <laughs> today's case is one I've actually heard about before. So it's the murder of 26-year-old real estate agent Lindsay Buziak. And it was a case that, you know, I'd heard on other podcasts. I would say I was superficially familiar with it. This case has been covered quite a bit in podcasts, but also on TV specials. So I had a basic understanding of what happened. This is one of these cases, if you've been in true crime for any amount of time, you'll have heard of this one. You have. I don't want to name these publications because they're pretty big names. And unfortunately, what I didn't know about this case is that there has been a ton of misinformation spread about Lindsay's case, even on some of these high profile publications. One in particular just so much of what was said is actually inaccurate. And I did not know that. Oh my gosh, it's like the modern day Black Dahlia. It is. I was thinking of you the whole time I was researching because I was like, it's so hard. You know, here at the Dark Oak, we really try to give accurate information. Yeah. But that's difficult when there's so much false information so much out there. Misinformation. And again, some of these sources, again, I, I actually applaud you for not wanting to like just put these sources on blast. But it is frustrating because this this big media outlet, news outlet, um, TV show that you think would have fact checked and you would think is trustworthy, it really turns out they kind of just go down this salacious route. Now, whether intentionally or just on accident, because again, I feel like a lot of the spokespeople, you know, the actual mouthpieces, if you will, they get their information from writers sure. in the background. But Gosh, do a little, do better. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And I will say it, it was a lot of work because I had to really rule out a lot of, a lot of stuff here. Yeah. But what I did find was this podcast called Murder on the Island. Okay. And it's presented by Capital Daily, which is a news website in Victoria, British Columbia, which is where Lindsay lived. And the host of this podcast, Xander Sherman, acknowledges all of the misinformation available on this case. Okay. And he spent years researching Lindsay's case. He worked with attorneys to uncover thousands of previously sealed court case documents, which is so cool. Like, these are the documents you, that this were in This is like court. dedication. Maybe one day we're going to get there. <laughs> I, I, I feel like you really have to like, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but no. I feel like you really have to dedicate yourself like he did to one case. He did. He literally spent years working on this. He was such a huge resource to me, which yeah. is why I wanted to shout him out. Now, I will say the file. Way to go, Xander. I know. Thank you. Thank you, Xander. The files that he was able to get are still heavily redacted. But again, he spent years on this. So after tons and tons of research and review, he was able to piece together a lot of the information that seemed to have some holes. He was able to fill some of those in, you know, holes created by some of the redactions and things of yeah. that nature. And so from that, along with witness interviews, he created this long form podcast called Murder on the Island. So the original recording is about six episodes and it was just so beneficial to me. It was just a great source because again he's working directly from these court documents so obviously all of my sources will be listed in the show notes as always but i just wanted to shout him out shout out his podcast because it really helped me to separate the facts from the fiction i just appreciate again somebody doing the extra work to try to find out the real stuff because i i feel like the misinformation it, it really like leads you it's like red herrings it's like these rabbit holes and how are we going to find out you know who the real to use my kids words who the real bad guy is right if we're if we're chasing again these red herrings so true so true so let me give you the facts Lindsay was born in victoria british columbia on november 2nd 1983 and her father jeff was in real estate and her mother evelyn was a stay-at-home mom with Lindsay and her sister sarah the family had a trailer that they kept on an RV lot near this beautiful lake, and that's where they would go summer. They didn't live there full time, but they would go summer there. And Lindsay and Sarah have these great memories of spending time at the lake and learning to swim there. They had a really happy childhood, although Jeff and Evelyn did end up divorcing, you know, when the girls got a little older, which was obviously really difficult for the girls. But overall, the girls had a great childhood. The family was very close. Lindsay was always described as bubbly happy, driven, smart. Sarah said that Lindsay always protected her and Lindsay's friends would say that everyone loved her. 
Yeah, and she's so pretty too. Oh, she's beautiful. I remember seeing pictures of her and just what a nice, nice lady. So beautiful. And, you know, being gorgeous like that and then having that great personality actually makes you a really good candidate for a job in real estate. Yeah, you're totally right. She was made for it. She was. So in her 20s, she decided she wanted to become a real estate agent. So she enrolled in the UBC Sauter School of Business Real Estate Trading Services Program. Wow. I know. What a a name. (laughs) It really is. (laughs) Soon after, she started dating a man named Jason Zalo, who was 27, and he was also an established realtor. Jason and Lindsay met at a real estate tutoring workshop, and Jason would say that they had an immediate connection. They had so much in common, and he really felt like he'd found the one. Oh, Their relationship progressed quickly, and they moved in together not long after they began dating. Their first home together was in the basement suite of Jason's mother's lakefront property. So Jason's mother, Shirley, was also a real estate agent, as was her other son, Ryan. So this was like a family business. Okay, yeah. They're the people to know. They are. <laughs> And from time to time, Shirley and Ryan would come stay at the lakefront house. But it was the basement suite where Jason and Lindsay, you know, spent their time. It was more of a vacation house during the summer, but they stayed there for a while. Eventually, 24-year-old Lindsay started missing the city life. So she and Jason moved into a downtown condo overlooking the water at Victoria Inner Harbor. So I just imagine a condo overlooking the water just sounds beautiful, right? Every single place you've described so far sounds magical. And again, if you're a real estate agent, I suppose you you know the places to look. You got the hookups. Yes. Lindsay was working as a real estate agent at Remax, which was also the same firm that Shirley, Jason, and Ryan Zalo worked at. And she was in the process of building her client base when on February 1st, 2008, she got a call from a woman a potential client who she had never spoken to before. Lindsay would later tell Jason that this woman spoke with a thick accent that she described as Spanish or Mexican. Okay. This woman told Lindsay that her husband had just been transferred from Vancouver to Victoria, and they wanted to look at a new build, $1 million home. And back in 2008, I mean, $1 million is a lot now, but back in 2008, it was a lot more. Yeah, that's, well... As you've already said, a dream house. Right. Not a Barbie dream house. A, a real, real dream, dream house. house. Right. She'd said she wanted a three bedroom, three bathroom house with a large primary bedroom and a separate area for a housekeeper to live. So this was luxury, uh, oh, you know, dang. luxury living. They're like making it happen. Right. She said she wanted to buy this house ASAP, like within two she days. She wanted to find her place quick. Right. Wow. Now, Lindsay didn't have any properties that fit this bill. But she could sell another broker's property and still make about 3% of the sale price. So that's $30,000 in commission. And you have a motivated buyer. I mean, that's like, as a real estate agent, that's what you want to hear. Right. Easy money, quick deal. It's going to be great. And a large budget. Right. Right. Now, being new in the business, Lindsay was really excited to have such a large sale. Like, this could put her on the map. And you know how it all works with the networking. So you do great things for her. You're able to provide exactly what she needs quickly. Then they tell more people. It's all about referrals. Yeah, I could see how she'd be really excited about this. Yes, this this was huge. So Lindsay was so excited. She knew that this brought big potential. So she asked the potential client, who referred you to me? And, you know, because I want to thank them. And the lady on the phone told her it was someone that worked for the client's husband, but she didn't have a name. Huh. Okay. Before getting off the phone, the two women made plans to begin looking at houses at 530 the next evening. After the call ended, Lindsay saved the woman's phone number in her phone under the name Million Dollar. Oh, man. She was really, this is like eggs in one basket. She was ready. Yeah. And of course, she immediately began looking for properties to show this potential new client. Do we know if she had written down her actual name anywhere? There's no documentation to say that Lindsay wrote down the woman's name. She was aware of the name, but nobody in her circle knows what the name was. Oh, shoot. They did find her daytimer, which had her notes from this conversation. A name wasn't written. But we're assuming she did provide one. Well, clearly. Otherwise, that would have been crazy suspicious. Right. So she knew it, but... Right. She hadn't written it down and didn't program it into her phone. Right. She Yeah, right. She called him in her phone million dollar. And then when she was talking 
about this couple to the people in her life. She referred to them as the Spanish couple. Well, and again, why would, I mean, if you would use their name, right. it wouldn't, I can see why she didn't. Right. But that's so, also, again, hindsight. Right. It's unfortunate, right? So we don't know the name. And if okay. we do, the police know it, We, but we as the public don't know this person's name. Okay, that's fair too. And also, what are the chances it's a real name? I can almost guarantee you it probably wasn't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Knowing what I know. Yeah, fair enough. Well, over the next 24 hours, Lindsay would get a couple of calls from this woman, just tweaking the details and confirming this appointment. And during at least one of these calls, Shirley, Jason's mother, would overhear Lindsay confirming the details she made with this client. In the world of real estate, this whole situation was a bit unusual. Getting cold calls from potential clients in and of itself isn't that strange, but for a brand new agent to be contacted by a stranger with such a large sale, that was what was so unusual. Right. Again, it's not like this referral, like they helped me get my million dollar mansion. They can help you get yours. It is a little unusual. I get right. that. Yeah. She's a newbie. This is a big sale. Like why me kind of thing. And this didn't go unnoticed by Lindsay. She would tell Jason that she was really excited, but she did not understand why this couple contacted her. Yeah. But again, you get hopeful, right? Of course. You're like this is my break. I don't know why I got lucky, but I'm going to see it through. You got it. You got it. So she wasn't exactly worried about the meeting, but it was unusual enough that she gave it maybe a little more thought than she would have if it had been a different, you know, a different client with a different price range, yeah, she's, et cetera. She's no dummy. She's no dummy. The night of this initial phone call, Friday night, Jason had gone out to play hockey and I guess he played, you know, late at night. So he didn't get home until around midnight. And when he did, he talked to Lindsay and he actually offered to show the house for Lindsay the following day. It's really nice of him. So nice of him. The reason why he did this was Lindsay was feeling a little stressed out about all of the things on her to-do list for that following day. Okay, so anxious just about fitting everything in, not necessarily about this client. Not necessarily. He, okay. Jason doesn't think she was necessarily anxious about the client. She'd given it some thought, but she wasn't worried about it. She was actually a little more preoccupied with the fact that Lindsay had been in charge of organizing a surprise bachelorette party for her friend on the mainland, which is about 71 miles from Victoria. And this party was scheduled for the same night as the showings. You know, she had a lot. She had to go from this, you know, yeah. from the showings, have a long drive. You know, yeah. it was a lot. Yeah. So Jason actually offered, again, to do the showings for Lindsay, but Lindsay really wanted to do them herself. And I can totally understand why. Of course. You're going to feel like you earned that money, right? Right. Yeah. So she declined. And this was actually the second time that day that Lindsay had turned down this offer because earlier in the evening, Lindsay had gone to dinner with Shirley and Lindsay was telling Shirley, you know, all the things that she had to do the next day. And then she had to, you know, go into Vancouver for her friend's bachelorette party and Shirley felt Lindsay was, again, feeling a little stressed. So she offered to show the property for Lindsay. And she also reminded Lindsay that her two sons, Ryan and Jason, both had real estate licenses. So any one of the three could show the house for her. The following day, Saturday, February 2nd, Lindsay visited the REMAX office. And I guess the weirdness of the situation was starting to get to her because she asked two different receptionists to do a search on the caller's name and use their phone number to see if anything would come up in the company database. But the searches came up empty. Nothing came up using the name or the phone number. Okay. So again, suspicions are correct. It's probably not a real number or maybe they hadn't dealt with the company, but yeah. Interesting. Right. Now, while she was at the office, fellow real estate agent Cal Faber would overhear Lindsay telling a group of other agents that she was really excited about the potential commission, but she was also a little nervous because she did not know these people. I think it would be a lot of nerves. I mean, not only who are these people, but am I going to be able to show this property well? Like, I would want to get more information on them just so I could have a way to relate with them. Like, maybe I could say, hey, I saw you're a member of this organization, or I see, you know, so-and-so, or I see you had a house over here. I know someone over there, like just to find a way to relate with someone. Yeah. That's what do you want to do that? Like as a salesperson, you want to kind of have an, an in, right. You don't want to blow it. You don't want to blow it. So I can see anxiety from both sides because she really wants this to happen. So she's like, so even if it's just information seeking to provide a better sales interaction, 
you know, I think you would want to do that. But then also, again, this like, how did they get me? Why did they pick me? Right. Yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It really does. Well, Cal said that when he heard the details of this meeting, he thought something sounded a little off. So he actually offered to go with Lindsay to the showing. Yeah. And he said several of the other agents standing around also offered to go with her, but she alleviated all of their concerns because she told them she would be taking Jason with her. Oh, okay. Now, about an Which hour. Which I wish she had. Well, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop interjecting here. <laughs> well, about an hour later, around 3.30 p.m., Jason and Lindsay had a late lunch at a restaurant called Sauce. And I don't know why, but the, the name of that restaurant just makes me hungry. I just really want to eat at Sauce. It just sounds good. <laughs> don't know what kind of restaurant it is, but. Gotta love a sauce. I want to go there. During this meal, Lindsay ate really quickly because she was feeling a little rushed and she wanted to have time to go back to their condo and get ready for this big showing that was happening in less than two hours. Yeah. And also immediately she's got to like book it to her friend's bachelorette party. You got it. Like that right there is enough to give me anxiety. I get it. Wow. During this meal, Lindsay showed Jason three to five feature sheets pertaining to houses that Lindsay was planning on showing this mystery couple. So it was different properties that she had planned on showing them. But the first house on her list was 1702 DeSousa Place in Gordon Head. Lindsay chose to show this home first because it fit the client's wish list to a T. As they parted, Lindsay told Jason she was excited and she was hoping to get an offer that very night. I feel like she's thinking this is kismet. Like this woman called. I don't really know how she got my information, but here she is. And the first one I found is exactly what she's looking exactly for. Exactly what she's looking for. Right. It does. It sounds just almost like meant to be. Yeah. So Lindsay left that meal. She went home. She got ready for the showings while Jason went to a meeting at a nearby auto detailing shop. And I read somewhere that maybe he was looking to sell that property. And maybe that's why he was headed to this this auto detailing shop. Now, while Jason was in this meeting, his friend Cohen made several calls to him because the two men were planning on hanging out and playing hockey, having some beers, just having a guy's night while Lindsay was at the bachelorette party. Sure. So a little after 5 p.m., Cohen met up with Jason. And after Cohen climbed into Jason's Range Rover, Jason explained that they had to make a little detour because Lindsay had called him and asked him to follow her to the showing. But she'd asked him to park near the house nonchalantly and not to make it obvious that he was there. But it would just make her feel a little better to know that he was nearby while she was doing the showing. So both men headed over, Jason driving, to the Gordon Head home. Now, this subdivision was so new that it did not even show up on GPS systems yet. So Jason couldn't get the navigation in his truck to pull up the address. Mm. So he had to call Lindsay for directions. And while he was on the phone with her, she said, oh, I've got to go. They're here. Okay. Witnesses saw Lindsay greeting the couple right outside the house around 5.30 p.m. The man was described as Caucasian, about six feet tall medium build and dark hair. The woman was described as Caucasian, between 35 and 40 years old with shorter hair, maybe right around like chin length okay. or, or shoulder length. And she was described as wearing a swirling black, hot pink and white dress. And there's actually a picture of this dress online. You can look it up. It is one of those dresses that like, if you saw it, you would notice it. Okay, it's, okay. and it's memorable. It's memorable, it's, okay. you know, loud. Well, I like that. It's really actually a cute dress. When I, when I heard it described, I was like, oh, not for me. And then I pulled it up and I was like, oh, I might wear that in a different life. Yeah, I feel like somebody who's wanting to buy a dream house at a million dollar budget would be wearing that dress. Right. Maybe I should wear that dress and just see what happens. Even though actually, maybe not. I don't know. Let's see how the story turns out. Um, <laughs> let's do. Like, Wait a minute. Let's do, shall we? Wait a minute. Where am I getting my fashion advice from? Right. <laughs> well, Lindsay ended up leading this well-dressed couple inside the house and then texted the address to Jason. About 15 minutes later, Jason and Cohen turned onto the street. And as they did, Jason saw a man and it looked like this man was walking inside the house using the front door. And then the man closed the door behind him. 
Now, Jason didn't see the front of this man. He only saw his back, but he described him as being well-dressed and his account would match the other witness accounts of the man they saw greeting Lindsay. Okay, so this is the same guy. Same guy. Now, Jason would say that when he first turned onto the street, the front door was open. So he believes the man would have heard his truck. So given what happens next, when Jason looks back on the scenario, he believes that he probably caught the man about to walk out of the front door. But when this man saw Jason's truck entering the street, oh. he turned around, closed, and locked the door behind him. Now, keep in mind also, this is February in Canada. Cold. Cold. But also, it's getting dark. It's like 530, but it's it's not okay. daylight. Yeah. So, so this is kind of twilight. So he's thinking the guy was coming out. He heard the truck and then the guy did an about face and went back. Right. Inside. But he doesn't think that until later At, when he first pulls in, he thinks, oh, they're just walking inside. Sure. It wasn't until later that he's like, mm, maybe I saw something else. Okay. Now, remembering that Lindsay did not want him to make it obvious that he was there. Jason did not pull up directly in front of the house. He parked down the street a bit, but a few minutes went by. There were no calls, no texts, no movement on the property. So he repositioned his truck to make it just a little bit more obvious that he was there. Even more time went by and he saw no activity. So Jason and Cohen both decided to go into the house and check things out. They walked up to the front door and immediately noticed that the lockbox that contained the house keys that would have been hanging on the front door was not there. So this indicated that maybe Lindsay had taken it inside with her. So they did the next obvious thing. They tried to open the front door, but strangely, it was locked. Now, this is very unusual. You wouldn't lock the front door when you're doing a showing. No. And as a matter of fact, when I've been viewing houses, they literally leave like the doors open. Right, right. And honestly, it's just so it doesn't of, get weird. Right. And, and it's because of cases like this that yeah. we've actually learned yeah. that showing houses can actually be really dangerous and yeah. so they do take these precautions yeah. to be to be really careful but in this scenario the door is closed and it's locked so immediately jason's like okay something's wrong yeah so he starts ringing the doorbell and he says he thinks he rang the doorbell probably 10 times of course but there was no answer he started trying to look inside the glass on the front door to see if he could see anything and he did actually see Lindsay's high heels by the front door, but that would not have been unusual, especially, you know, in a new build like this. You want sure. to protect the carpet, protect the floor. Sure. But they weren't like strewn about. They were just sitting by the they door. They were sitting there as if she'd taken them off so she could walk through the house and not, right. you know, damage the floors. But there was no other sign of Lindsay or her clients anywhere. Yep. This is when it starts getting creepy. Pretty creepy. So Jason called his mother, Shirley to try to get the access code for the garage. And she was able to get it from the listing agent, but when he tried the code, it didn't work. So oh. we're assuming maybe it was the wrong the access wrong code. code. I don't think there was necessarily anything nefarious with that. Right. So he starts walking around the house. But also how disappointing if you're Jason. Oh my gosh, so disappointing. So he's walking around the house. He did find a side door, but when he tried it, it was locked. Yeah. And at this point he's totally panicked, so he calls 911. And on this call, Jason said that he and his girlfriend were realtors. She was meeting with clients, had asked him to follow her, asked him to follow her for protection. And he told him they were not answering, you know, at the house. So it was more of like a welfare check request. Could you just come and yeah. just make sure everything's OK? Yeah. While Jason was making this phone call, Cohen continued walking around the house and he found a side door that was actually cracked open. Oh, but in order to get access to the store, Jason actually had to help him climb over, climb over a fence. But then once he was inside the house, Cohen ran to the front door and unlocked it from the inside so Jason could come in. Yes. Immediately, the men start looking around and yelling for Lindsay, obviously. Yes. They went in different directions. Cohen stayed downstairs and was looking around for her. And Jason started going upstairs. But as soon as he started making his way up, he could see into the primary bedroom on yes. the second floor and he could see Lindsay laying on the floor Lindsay had been stabbed multiple times on the front of her body and she was laying face up jason yelled for cohen to call 911 again because now we know something really bad has happened yeah and jason began administering cpr but 
he knew almost immediately that she was gone. He said that she was so riddled with these injuries that he could hear the air coming through the puncture wounds oh, as he was trying to give gosh. her CPR. Horrifying. Awful, and awful. sad. And gosh, this is terrible. It's so awful. When St. Itch police arrived, they took Jason and Cohen into custody. Jason kept telling the police that they should be looking for the people who actually did this. But he said that the authorities didn't seem to be listening. They seemed to be more concerned with detaining him and Cohen than actually looking for the murderers. Jason felt strongly that since he had seen someone in the front doorway of the house less than 30 minutes prior, they couldn't have gone far. And he believes that if these initial moments were handled differently, we may not still be talking about Lindsay's unsolved murder 16 years later. Yeah. And I want to know, how did these people get away? How did they get out? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm assuming through that door. I'm assuming that's why the door was cracked. And then these two, they, they hopped the fence too? I guess. And I don't know. Escaped on foot. That part, we don't know. And if authorities know, yeah, it's true. it hasn't they been were, released. They didn't have a vehicle there? How did they get don't there? Know. Don't know. Oh, this is wild. I mean, I have to assume there was a vehicle, but that hasn't been released to the public. Yikes. Okay. Jason was taken to the police station, but said that it still took several hours for the interview to begin. And that was causing him to get even more upset because he felt like this was time that could have been used looking for the actual murderers. And then that makes him look hostile. And then that makes him look more guilty. Right. Oh, how infuriating. So upsetting. So Jason was finally interviewed and allowed to leave the police station early the next morning. The investigation revealed that Lindsay was the victim of multiple stab wounds. She had nicks and cuts all over her body, and the stab wounds were primarily on her chest and abdomen. Police were able to determine that the attack began around 541. And I know that probably seems very... That is very oddly specific. Right. Here's how they know that. Lindsay pocket dialed a friend with whom she'd not been in regular contact with and this call resulted in a muffled voicemail message and they believe that that happened while she was being attacked <gasps> how eerie is that it's awful can you imagine being that friend no oh, it, it almost like makes me feel sick to even think yeah about that Ooh. but with that they were able to determine it was probably I mean, about as far 541 as, as far as evidentiary usefulness great as far as that friend goes, horrible. I know for her, his or her, I don't know, who, yeah. you know, gender, but for their emotional well-being, like it's Yikes. upsetting. Yeah. Police believe the suspect or suspects left the scene immediately after the stabbing, leaving behind a trail of bloody footprints on the staircase. And authorities believe that they were in the process of getting their shoes in an effort to walk out the front door when Jason pulled onto the street, causing them to flee out the back door, oh, leaving it cracked. Mm -hmm. And that's how Cohen was later able to enter the home. So Jason really did pull up on them right after they oh, killed his girlfriend. What a sick, sick feeling. Awful. A canine unit came in and searched the exterior of the home, but could not find a scent. And I will say that there was part of the house that they believed had been, you know, corrupted by comings and goings of first responders and stuff. Yeah. So that yeah. may have affected the results there. Police have never said publicly whether a murder weapon was found, which I think is really interesting. Oh, kind of strange. It is. And maybe it was something unique. Maybe that's why they're not releasing it. It might be. Might be. I have no idea. Huh. I do know no one has ever been charged with Lindsay's murder. In an effort to help with the investigation, Jason gave authorities his and Lindsay's shared laptop. He granted permission to have their condo searched. He offered to take polygraph tests, which Jason took and passed. He offered his fingerprints and he spoke to authorities repeatedly without a lawyer present. So I he mean, was really trying to help. I, well, I was going to say, this sounds like the makings of an innocent man. Right. And also Cohen was with him the whole time. Correct. So in order to say Jason's guilty, you would have to say that Cohen is in on in, it, in on it right. somehow. You got it. You got it. And a year after Lindsay's murder, Jason Zalo was cleared by investigators and ruled out as a person of interest. But unfortunately, a lot of people still think that Jason and his family might be responsible for Lindsay's death. Authorities have said that they don't believe that Lindsay's murder had anything to do with her job 
also ruling out Shirley and Ryan Zalo as people of interest. But despite this, in the 16 years since Lindsay's death, the entire Zalo family has suffered. They've suffered losses to their income. Jason says the comments about his family have hurt every aspect of his family's life. Shirley says that despite her family being cleared of the investigation, anonymous people have continued to attack their family online. Her real estate signs have been defaced. People no longer want to use her, all despite having been cleared by authorities. Yeah, but it took him an entire year to do that. To clear him, and they treated him definitely as, I mean, at best case, a prime suspect. At worst case, the actual perpetrator. Right. So... Yeah, I mean, I can I can see just from public appearances why it would appear he was guilty. Right, right. And he was found, you know, right there with her. Yeah, that's now, so unfortunate. Now, without getting too much into it, because again, a lot of this, you know, is misinformation. But I will tell you, the misinformation is probably what helped to spread, you know, the idea that maybe Jason or his family was involved. Ooh, okay, I want to know. Friends and family of Lindsay started coming out of the woodwork saying, oh, you know what? Like, I think she was going to break up with him and things of that nature. Oh. Which Jason says, yeah, our relationship wasn't perfect, but there's no indication that we were going to be breaking up or anything like that. But of course, when you start hearing that kind of stuff and then it takes a year to clear this guy. He People was start putting up, two and like, two together. Yeah, we straight up detained. Right. I mean, right. Yeah, that looks suspicious. Right. So I can kind of understand why the public again, might think the story is so far-fetched that some random person called up and then randomly killed her i mean even for me i'm sitting here and i said i think jason's actions are that of an innocent man mm -hmm. but the alternative is so bizarre it is so bizarre it is it really it is. would be much easier to believe that it's him even though again based on everything that we know i do think he's he's innocent but right. it's still bizarre so bizarre so bizarre now, I mentioned in the beginning of this episode that Capital Daily worked for years to gather the court documents on this case. Yeah. Some of those documents are ITOs or information to obtain. Police use these ITOs to get court orders and they allow authorities to monitor things like phone calls and GPS tracking, Facebook and other online activity. So here's some interesting information that was gathered using those ITOs. I'm just gonna preface this by saying a lot of this is stuff that could be suspicious, but it could also be nothing. So I'm just going to mention some of it, okay. but I have no idea what any of it means. Okay, fair. Jason brought his and Lindsay's shared laptop to the SPD, and they turned it over for, for forensic analysis. And according to the ITOs, Constable Paul Brooks found evidence on the computer of chat messages that had been deleted. Now, because of the heavy redaction in these court documents, we don't know much more than that. But we do know that there were some deleted chat messages on Lindsay's computer. While reviewing Lindsay's online activity, authorities noticed that many of her Facebook friends were recognized as having been heavily involved in some well-known drug activity. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. And these people were so involved in this, you know, criminal uh, circle that numerous police officers recognize them just from their social media profiles. Eek! Right? Now, when this information was brought to Lindsay's friends and family, they told authorities that Lindsay really just used her Facebook as more of a marketing tool and that the people she was associated with on the website were not necessarily her friends in real life. And I can see that. That's possible, but still... It, it, it is something to think about. And also, I think if I'm trying to grow my high end real estate business, I don't know that I would be trying to like build up my social media with known drug users or I, sellers or criminals. I mean, I have not been a realtor, but I would imagine they're probably not the most lucrative clients. Exactly. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. <laughs> Now, authorities also noticed a pattern of activity on Lindsay's Facebook page where her Facebook friends would regularly post on her page or her wall. They referred to it as a wall in these documents. But there was a lapse in this activity leading up to Lindsay's murder. Huh. She would normally receive messages posted on her wall virtually every day. 
sometimes she would go three or four days without something being posted by someone else, by a friend. Yeah. But on average, people were posting on her wall daily. But from January 24th to February 3rd, there were no messages posted. And this was very inconsistent with her normal activity. Oh. Now, again. Maybe this is just a weird coincidence. Could but be. But it's weird. It is weird. And again, these ITOs were heavily redacted. So in reading them, Xander from Capital Daily was able to see a line coming out of one of these redactions that read, quote, these deleted wall messages, end quote. And that led him to wonder if maybe the missing posts were actually deleted posts. And it would have been, the assumption is they were deleted by Lindsay or deleted by the poster, or we don't know. We really don't know. Oh, so frustrating. It is. And no one in Lindsay's immediate circle seemed to know anything about why Lindsay or anyone else would have deleted any Facebook posts or messages. Now, Lindsay had taken a trip in December 2007, so just a couple months before her murder, to Calgary, where her father had moved. While she was there, she tried to contact a relative of someone named Eric, who we believe was like an old friend of hers, maybe an old friend from high school or something like that. So yeah. not a close friend, but someone she knew in her past. No one really knew why she was trying to reach this guy. But this guy was allegedly later associated with a major drug bust. And there was actually this big drug ring that was taken down. And there was some informant who helped to take this down. Now, it has been proven Lindsay was not this informant. Okay. But again, with the rumors and the misinformation, you might hear that Lindsay was the informant or that the people involved in this drug ring believed her to be an informant. And therefore, her murder was a result of that. I cannot confirm or deny any of that, but we do know that she did reach out to this guy who was somehow involved with this drug ring and he was arrested for okay. that soon after Lindsay tried to contact him. Got it. While going through Lindsay's Blackberry, authorities were able to gather more information on the phone the potential client had used to call Lindsay. This phone was a prepaid phone that had been purchased at a convenience store and activated online just a few weeks prior to Lindsay's death. The name and address the person used were fake, and the phone had only ever been used to contact Lindsay and then to check its own voicemail messages. Yeah, so they were definitely going for her. Whoever killed her wanted her. It was a hit. Wow, and so scary. I just got chills. I mm -hmm. literally just got full body chills. It is really frightening, and this phone became known as the crime phone. Now, during this initial phone call with Lindsay, the woman allegedly told Lindsay that she and her husband would be flying to Victoria on February 2nd. However, the tracking of this phone showed that this woman was already on the island when she originally reached out to Lindsay. Ah! I mean, literally, I, you know what's funny, what's going through my head right now is the theme song from Jaws. Oh, yes. I literally, like her just sitting there, Dun, yes. Dun, 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 dun. I'm like, no. It's true. It's true. Just like, I've got you in my sights and I'm coming yes. to get you. And I'm coming to get you. And I know all these things that you don't know. Ugh. Okay. Again, full body chills. It, it's really scary. Well, get this. Lindsay provided the address to the person with the crime phone during a 10 minute call on the day of her murder. There's nothing unusual about that. Hey, meet right. me here at 530. But the crime phone then traveled to that address, 1702 <gasps> DeSouza Place. Oh! And the phone was in this area for a while before the planned meeting time of 530. And so police believe this was to help the person or persons of interest familiarize themselves with the area and possibly plan escape routes. Oh, of course it was. I mean, to me, I'm like, what else could it be? Right. Of course, you're going to go familiarize oh yourself with gosh. the area. Oh, my gosh. So she had no chance. No chance. No chance. Oh, and I don't even know if somebody terrifying. else had gone with her, if maybe no. they both would have. They, they probably both would have been out. Been victims. Now, the ITOs do not say where the crime phone went after the murder. However, the fact that the crime phone was only used to contact Lindsay. Yeah, I'm sure it was just ditched somewhere. Yeah. Right. And it means that whoever was using it was working really hard to not leave a trail leading yeah. back to themselves. So they think it actually is probably pretty organized. 
ah, like not organized crime. Right. It wasn't just a, a crime of passion. You uh, know? No. And it definitely sounds, I mean, again, you can't say for sure, but it definitely sounds like an organized crime ring, like a drug ring of some kind. It, it, to me, it absolutely does. And then when you add it with all that stuff that doesn't really mean anything, but when you put it all together, yeah, to me, it, it might mean something. Poor Lindsay, because it sounds like she was just, I mean, on the periphery of this. Yeah, I don't know why. That's the part that gets me is I don't know why she was not a known drug user, according to anybody who knows her. She wasn't involved in trafficking or selling drugs as far as anybody has said. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I mean, but it does give, in my mind, it gives more credence to the idea that someone thought she was an informant. That could absolutely be possible, but they would have been mistaken, which either way, even if she was or wasn't, you know, it's still awful. But yeah. like, if, if that's why this happened, I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't, the but she informant. wasn't. Yeah, yeah. It's really awful. Now authorities did believe because this one crime phone had only been used to contact Lindsay, that there must've been a secondary phone that would have been used to communicate with outside with anyone outside of Lindsay. Oh, sure. Yes. So the SPD began looking for dump records for phones that mimicked the crime phone's location. So it's going to get a little scientific-y here. Oh, I like this. I know. It's kind of it's kind of cool to think, wow, what yeah. Like, they they really did it here. Actual well, after they completely arrested and interrogated the wrong person. But of course, I get it why they originally sure. thought it was him. But it sounds like they really kind of got it in gear after that. They tried. I feel like they I feel like they really tried. So what they did was the SPD officers conducted test calls from four cell phones with the goal to simulate the trip that they believe the crime phone made. So they used different cell service companies on a simulation of the route they believed was used by the crime phone users to see which towers picked up the calls. And then they used that to try to narrow down phone numbers that followed the same route. Clever, isn't it? They were able to narrow down a couple persons of interest <gasps> using these phone records. Oh, tell me. Well, here's the thing. We don't know who those people are. No! This is still an ongoing investigation, and so much of Lindsay's case file is still sealed. But we do know that authorities used this information to come up with a theory. Okay. So authorities believe Lindsay's murder was a pre-planned event by an organized criminal group. The public has not been given a why. I assume that the information that was found using those ITOs probably helped them come up with this theory. And we're obviously hoping this case will soon be solved and we can have those answers and Lindsay's family can have some closure. On January 2020, just before the 13th year anniversary of Lindsay's murder, police made the announcement during a press conference that they had obtained assistance from the FBI and they were using technology that had been previously unavailable in an effort to help them gain new leads. So do you agree with investigators theory? To me, that makes sense. I mean, this doesn't sound like a crime of passion to me, and it doesn't sound like just somebody off the street would do like this. This seems like somebody who kind of knows what they're doing. Well, now, I don't know why. Very premeditated. Right. But even I wouldn't. I mean, this sounds silly, but I wouldn't know how to do this. Like, I would not know how to murder someone and hide it and do all like, I just wouldn't know how. So I think you need to give yourself more credit. <laughs> I just need to listen to more true crime podcasts and write more episodes. But well, folks, I'm literally looking at my co-host right now who's wearing a D.B. Cooper shirt oh, that gotcha. just has this picture that says legend. Yeah, well, you know. So if anybody's in, in training to be a criminal mastermind, it's Cynthia. Don't let her fool you. She sounds cute and innocent, but I'll tell you, I, I know the truth here. <laughs> Shh, you're supposed to keep my secrets. I am D.B. Cooper. <laughs> right. If they come look and don't tell them you saw me. But yeah, I mean, and even to me, I kind of said it earlier. I can't imagine who would have been able to pull this off in such an, or, such an organized way unless it was really, you know, this organized crime ring of some kind. I feel like it had to have been. And again, I don't know the why. It just doesn't sound like these were amateurs. Right. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Right. These were not amateurs. And, and Lindsay did not seem like you know, a person who was living a lifestyle that would make her high risk for being a victim. The so fact that I she was tied up in this is odd. Right. And I almost wonder, is it like a mistaken identity? But they had so many 
I mean, it wasn't like this happened all at once. It wasn't like it was a, you know, it, again, a lot of premeditation went into it. So you think if they, you think they would have figured out that she was the wrong person. Yeah. You think they would make happened. sure they it's got not the right like, person. It's not like they told her to meet at the house and then a different real estate agent so, showed up and they right. assumed it was her. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like it was her all the way through. So the chance of it being mistaken identity, I think would be a little bit of a stretch, but again, why would they target her? Right. They were obviously convinced that she was the person. Yeah, that they needed. They needed. Why we we don't know. Oh gosh. The FBI and the SPD are specifically re-examining items obtained at the crime scene and digital evidence using the the new technology and and the ways we've grown and being able to test this kind of evidence. Sure. Our Branch of Hope Foundation recipient for March 2024 is the Justice for Lindsay Buziak Walk. And this is a walk which is held every year on the anniversary of Lindsay's death. A little over a month ago on the 16th anniversary of her death, Jeff Buziak, Lindsay's father, yeah. said, quote, This is 16 years since Lindsay was murdered. The 14th time, I believe, we've participated in this walk as a reminder to authorities that Lindsay's murder is unsolved and also to remind the community that the conspirators and the killers of Lindsay are still at large in the community, end quote. Now, yeah. Xander Sherman, the host of Murder on the Island, attended one of these annual memorial walks in yes. Lindsay's name. These walks originally started when Jeff, in his grief, would just go out and walk and think about Lindsay. And they've grown over the years, and now walkers carry signs, and they wear buttons of support. Bless so, it. I know. The walks end at the Parliament buildings that house the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia. And Jeff chose this destination because it was a prominent place, and he feels it's an important place to have their voice heard. So Jeff's trying really hard to keep Lindsay's case alive, and the only way he knows how to do it is to stay like prominent so he really is active in the media he's working to keep her memory alive by appearing in interviews and on tv and podcasts and websites he's just really doing everything anyone he that can. will listen yeah right so that's that's where it stands right now Lindsay's case is still unsolved it's still closed i mean we, we i say we Xander <laughs> yeah. really had to work hard to even get the information that that he got, you know, and, and this is where we are. And, you know, I'm sorry if what you've heard about this case before wasn't accurate, because, again, so much of what I heard, you know, I haven't even repeated in this podcast because it can't be substantiated. But a lot of what you've heard on this case may or may not be true. And a lot of it, I can tell you, is not. You know, what's crazy about that is. I don't feel like this case needs anything extra because it is so mind boggling on its own. Everything that you've presented presented to us as as factual. I think the facts are so crazy in this case. It doesn't need more. Right. Well, and I don't know that people are even necessarily outright spreading false information. But like, for instance, a lot of her stab wounds were to her abdomen and her chest area. And that has been translated into her breasts were mutilated. Oh, therefore even that making was probably this... just a byproduct right. of the stab wounds. Right. Sure. So you will often hear on this case that her breasts were mutilated. This was obviously a sexually motivated or an a personal oh. anger, like, you know, a jilted lover or somebody who, you know, really just hated her as a woman. And the coroner's report does not say anything about her breasts being mutilated. She was just stabbed in the chest and abdomen. Yeah. So it's stuff like that that's just, you know, I mean. The red herrings. Of right. It all. Yeah. And and again, I think if you really bought into that, you would look back on Jason again. Right. And that, I think that and I think that's why you even bring it up, you know, is because when you hear that, I don't think, oh, an organized crime ring i think oh somebody who really hates her or a, a, a girl who's jealous of her or a, a, a ex-boyfriend or maybe a current boyfriend who you know is mad at her well and really i think you know if you look at a crime scene like that that would be your where your mind would go to anyway you know most people are 
are harmed or killed by someone that they know. Mm -hmm. So to think that this is some organized crime spree killing, I mean, that would not be what your mind would go to first. So then if you find these things that support what you're, what you already suspect is what happened, right? it's easy to kind of fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I genuinely think that truth is stranger than, than fiction. Absolutely. Absolutely. And on top of losing Lindsay, you know, it's really devastating that Jason and his family have had to relive the loss of this person who they loved every day and, and be accused of being the killers. And, you know, that's just a second tragedy that's happened. So it's really, really sad. Well, I do love at the Dark Oak through the Branch of Hope Foundation that we can bring more awareness to this walk that will hopefully bring her family justice. Absolutely. And really figure out what happened because they absolutely deserve it. And I'm going to go ahead, if you don't mind, and talk a little bit about our updates to our Branch of Hope Foundation. Please do. I'm really excited about it. Okay. For the last three months, Cynthia and I have been working to make the Branch of Hope Foundation as effective as possible in three ways. That would be giving in a meaningful way, increasing the dollar amount given to each organization we choose to support, and making it easy for you, our Silver Seeking listeners, to participate, share, and to give. And the true stories we tell on this podcast do provide entertainment and excitement, but we always want to remember that there is a real person with a real family and friends and dreams and hopes attached to them. And we never want to forget that human part of what we do here at the Dark Oak. We're not just here to tell salacious stories about someone else's hardships. We genuinely are trying to bring information um, and, and clarity into some of these cases and if we can give back financially in some way. And that's what we're hoping that this podcast can grow. We're hoping that our revenues grow so we can give more back. That really is in our hearts, guys. We're not just saying that to somehow fluff ourselves up. We genuinely want to be able to give back to a lot of these families that need it. They really need it. And the Branch of Hope Foundation allows us to give back to the community, to spread awareness about these unsolved cases, and hopefully bring a little bit of comfort and hope to those that we meet. In light of this, Cynthia and I have decided to make one more little tweak to the Branch of Hope Foundation. So starting this month in March, we will only feature one Branch of Hope Foundation nonprofit recipient. We believe this will allow us to bring more awareness and financial support to each individual organization and give them a chance to shine. In the last three months, we had presented you with two nonprofit organizations. And at this point, we said, you know what? Each of these is so worthy of our time and our support. We want to give them a full month to just be their own. And this month, we want to be all in on the Justice for Lindsay Buziak walk. So all month a portion of our proceeds that we receive will go to that Justice for Lindsay Buziak walk. And again, we want to tell you we appreciate so much our loyal listeners, first of all, hanging with us through this process as we try to find out who we are and how we could best give back. If you've been from with us from the beginning, you've seen some changes along the way, but I feel like each one of them makes us better and makes us more relevant in this world of true crime and the world of mysteries. And and really a I hope we are eventually viewed as a an advocate for victims. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we've we're we're still trying to find our way and how we can best serve our community and we're we're super excited about it. Yeah, if you think about it, Cynthia, we launched our first episode in August of 2023. Mm-hmm. Think about how far we've come in really a relatively short amount of months in the life of a podcast. We're still going strong and you know, we're I feel like we're we're just being able to give back in such more meaningful ways now. It's really fulfilling. We're really really excited about it. And it's all thanks to you, our listeners. We couldn't do it without you. That is absolutely the case. We're here telling you the cases, but it's your financial support. The more you give, the more we are able to give. And I I love that because it's like this teamwork. It is. It's it's not just Stephanie and me. This podcast isn't just about Stephanie and me. It's all of us. We're a team. We're a family. 
That's right. And again, we are still simply a podcast leading through words and actions, and we want to make sure your voice is heard. If you loved this episode, love us or love what we are doing at the Branch of Hope Foundation, please like and subscribe and tell someone. Forward this episode to a friend who might like it. You can also join our Patreon, which will allow us to keep creating and connecting with you. Absolutely. Please send us an email at the dark oak podcast at gmail.com. We are open to your questions, comments, and anything else you want to share. And for other ways to connect, hop over to the dark oak.com. Be sure to follow us to our next episode where I will tell you all about the possible escape from Alcatraz. <laughs> Did they make it? I feel like there might actually be a cover up involved in that story oh. too. So. Make sure you come back, kiddos. I can't wait to hear about it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. This episode of The Dark Oak was created, researched, written, recorded, hosted, edited, published, and marketed by Cynthia and Stephanie of Just Us Gals Productions and made possible by you, our shiver-seeking listener. Special thanks goes to Justice Himes for our incredible artwork and Ryan Crete for our amazing music.